you could think of your mind as if it were a garden. To begin with, a garden is a patch of dirt. You may have a lot of brambles of self-hatred and rocks of despair, anger and worry. An old tree called fear needs pruning. Once you get some of these things out of the way and the soil is in good shape, you add some little seeds or plants of joy and prosperity. The sun shines down on it and you water it and give it nutrients and loving attention. At first, not much seems to be happening, but you don't stop. You keep taking care of your garden. If you are patient, the garden will grow and blossom. The same with your mind. You select the thoughts that will be nurtured, and with patience they grow and contribute to creating the garden of experiences you want. We all make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes while you are learning. As I said, so many of you are cursed with perfectionism. You won't give yourself a chance to really learn anything new because if you don't do it perfectly in the first three minutes, you assume you are not good enough. Anything you're going to learn takes time. When you first begin doing something, it usually doesn't feel right. To show you what I mean, take a moment right now and clasp your hands together. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Clasp your hands and notice which thumb is on top. Now open your hands and then clasp your hands again with the other thumb on top. It probably feels strange, odd, maybe even wrong. Clasp them again the first way, then the second, and the first again and the second way, and hold it. How does it feel now? Not so odd, not so bad. You're getting used to it. Maybe you can even learn to do it both ways. It's the same thing when we are doing something a new way. It may feel different, and we immediately judge it. Yet with a little bit of practice, it can become normal and natural. We're not going to love ourselves totally in one day, but we can love ourselves a little bit more every day. Each day, we give ourselves a little bit more love, and in two or three months, we will have come so much further in loving ourselves. So mistakes are your stepping stones. They are valuable because they're your teachers. Don't punish yourself for making a mistake. If you are willing to learn and grow from the mistake, then it serves as a step towards fulfillment in your life. Some of us have been working on ourselves for a very long time and wonder why we still have issues that come up for us. We need to keep reinforcing what we know, not resisting by throwing up our hands in the air and saying, what's the use? As we learn new ways, we need to be gentle and kind to ourselves. Remember the garden. When the negative weeds grow, pluck them out as quickly as you can. Number four, we must learn to be kind to our minds. Let's not hate ourselves for having negative thoughts. We can think of our thoughts as building us up rather than beating us up. We don't have to blame ourselves for negative experiences. We can learn from these experiences. Being kind to ourselves means we stop all blame, all guilt, all punishment, and all pain. Relaxation can help us as well. Relaxation is absolutely essential for tapping into the power within. Because if you are tense and frightened, you shut off your energy. It only takes a few minutes a day to allow the body and the mind to let go and relax. At any moment, you can take a few deep breaths, close your eyes, and release whatever tension you're carrying. As you exhale, become centered and say to yourself silently, I love you, all is well. You will notice how much calmer you feel. 
You are building messages that say you don't have to go through life tense and frightened all the time. Meditate on a daily basis. I also recommend quieting your mind and listening to your own inner wisdom. Our society has made meditation into something mysterious and difficult to achieve. And yet meditation is one of the oldest and simplest processes there is. All we need to do is get into a relaxed state and repeat silently to ourselves words like love or peace or anything meaningful to us. Om is an ancient sound that I often use at my workshops and it seems to work very well. We could even repeat I love myself or I forgive myself or I am forgiven and then just listen for a while. Some people think that if they meditate they have to stop their minds from thinking. We really can't stop the mind but we can slow down our thoughts and then just let them flow through. Some people sit with a pad and pencil and write down their negative thoughts because they seem to dissipate more easily. If we can get to a state where we are watching our thoughts float by, oh, there's a fear thought and some anger. Now there's a love thought and now a disaster. There's an abandonment thought, a joy thought. And don't give these thoughts importance then we begin to use our tremendous power wisely. You can begin meditation anywhere and allow it to become a habit. Think of meditation as focusing on your higher power. You become connected with yourself and your inner wisdom. You can do it in whatever form you like. Some people go into a kind of meditation while they're jogging or walking. Again, don't make yourself wrong for doing it differently. I love to get on my knees in the garden and dig in the dirt. It's a great meditation for me. An excellent, easy to understand book on meditation is Minding the Body, Mending the Mind by Joan Borsenko. Visualize optimistic outcomes. Visualization is also very important, and there are many techniques you can use. Dr. Carl Symington, in his book, Getting Well Again, recommends a lot of visualization techniques for people with cancer, and they often yield excellent results. With visualization, you create a clear, positive image that enhances your affirmation. Many of you have written to me about the kinds of visualizations you do, along with your affirmations. The important thing to remember about visualizations is that they must be compatible with the kind of person you are, otherwise your visualizations will not work. For instance, a woman with cancer pictured the good killer cells in her body attacking the cancer and killing it. At the end of the visualization, she doubted whether she had done it correctly and didn't feel that it was working for her. So I asked her, are you a killer person? And she answered, I personally don't feel good about creating a war in my body. So I suggested that she change her visualization to one that was a little more gentle. I think it's better to use images like the sun melting the sick cells, or a magician transforming them with his magic wand. When I had my cancer, I used the visualization of cool, clear water washing the diseased cells out of my body. We need to do visualizations that are not so offensive to us on the subconscious level. Those of us who have family or friends who are sick do them an injustice by continually seeing them sick. Visualize them well. Send them good vibrations. However, remember that getting well is really up to them. There are many good audio tapes with guided visualizations and meditations that you can give them to help them through this process if they are open. If not, just send them love. Everyone can visualize describing your home, having a sexual fantasy, 
imagining what you would do to a person who hurt you, are all visualizations. It's amazing what the mind can do. Number five. The next step is to praise yourself. Criticism breaks down the inner spirit and praise builds it up. Acknowledge your power, your God self. We are all expressions of the infinite intelligence. When you berate yourself, you belittle the power that created you. Begin with the little things. Tell yourself that you are wonderful. If you do it once and then stop, it doesn't work. Keep at it, even if it's one minute at a time. And believe me, it does get easier. The next time you do something new or different, or something you are just learning and you're not too adept at, be there for yourself. It was a big thrill the first time I spoke at the Church of Religious Science in New York. I remember it very well. It was a Friday noon meeting. People wrote questions and put them in a basket for me, the speaker. I brought the basket to the podium and answered the questions and did a small treatment after each one. After I finished, I walked away from the podium and said to myself, Louise, you were fantastic, considering this was the first time out. By the time you do this six times, you're going to be a pro. I didn't berate myself and say, oh, you forgot to say this or that. I didn't want to have the second time be something that would frighten me. If I beat myself up the first time, I would beat myself up the second time, and I would dread speaking in the end. And after a couple of hours, I thought of what I could change to improve. I never made myself wrong. I was very careful to praise myself and congratulate myself for being wonderful. And by the time I had conducted six meetings, I was a pro. I think we can apply this method in all areas of our lives. I continued speaking at the meetings for quite some time. It was wonderful training because it taught me how to think on my feet. Allow yourself to accept good whether you think you deserve it or not. I've discussed how believing that we are not deserving is our unwillingness to accept good in our lives. It's what stops us from having what we want. How could we create anything good for ourselves if we think we don't deserve to have good? Think about the laws of deserving in your home. Did you feel good enough, smart enough, tall enough, pretty enough, whatever? And what do you have to live for? You know you are here for a reason, and it's not just to buy a new car every few years. What are you willing to do to fulfill yourself? Are you willing to do affirmations, visualizations, treatments? Are you willing to forgive? Are you willing to meditate? How much mental effort are you willing to exert to change your life and make it the life you want?